just let the Lord stir us a little bit. We'll go ahead and let the students start making their way out for their time in the Word with Pastor Jesse. While they're finding their place, I want you to go to Ephesians 3, our continued systematic study of God's Word tonight. I'm just going to get into that for just a little bit. I, I may not even get out of the first verse. I just turned them off. I may not even get out of the first verse we're going to deal with, but, uh, but we'll see. We'll see what the Lord has. Amen. It's been a sweet service already tonight. I appreciate you so very, very much being in the house. Uh, let me just uh, say a couple of things. I, I want to get stuff out of the way before we get into preaching. Uh, it's exciting week. It's going to be an exciting day tomorrow. <laughs> uh, we're going to need your help. We need our friends online. We need their help. Everybody been asking, 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 asking. Tonight at midnight, we literally hit over 100 nations that we are streaming come out in Jesus' name. Yet. Amen. So that happens tonight at midnight. You wouldn't believe the, the message that uh, Wayne sent, just all of the, the nations that will have subtitles. I mean, it's beautiful. I mean, we're all over Africa and the Middle East and Canada and UK, and of course, all of the United States, and we've got uh, Spanish and French and Portuguese and you, you name it. I mean, it's it literally in a hundred plus nations tonight at midnight. Amen. It's going to be beautiful. And so Amazon Prime... Uh, Apple TV, iTunes, Google TV, and then YouTube TV, right? Not the YouTube that you normally watch, the subscription-based YouTube uh, with Google. And so, man, different ones, uh, minister it, use it. It's a ministry for us in different nations, in different areas. And so help us out. Rent it, buy it, get it for some friends. People are going to be showing it all over in churches, and we're excited about it. And so tonight at midnight, it's going to be a beautiful thing. We saw what the Lord did March 13th and then reoccurring again in April uh, with with just the theaters, right? With just a couple thousand theaters with all of those people packed out in those seats, what the Lord did. Can you imagine when millions around the world can watch it in their pajamas in their house? Amen. I'm telling you, God's about to get his glory and deliverance is about to reach a whole new stratosphere. And I'm telling you, people are going to be set free, healed. Miracles, signs, and wonders are going to happen. And so tonight at midnight, I don't expect you have to stay up all night, although I'll think about it. Amen. And see what happens. And then uh, tomorrow, help us put it on all your social media. We'll put it out tomorrow as well. And uh, you share those links and we're going to get the gospel literally around the world the full gospel amen the full gospel and so i'm super super amped up and excited about that so so many thousands have been asking and calling and writing and you know m messaging the office well tonight at midnight it goes live so again uh not netflix now that's a, that's a whole nother monster right we'll we'll come around to them after it's been streaming uh on the subscription-based platform for some time and so uh it's kind of the what do they call it the pay to play right pay-per-view and so that's where it'll be tonight at midnight most everybody has amazon or google or itunes and apple tv and so that's where it's going to be streaming, as well as the Salem Network. That's a brand new thing for us. That's a Christian network, the Salem Network. They're going to be streaming that for us. We're excited about that. And, uh, and they're, they're reaching millions of people. It's, it's a brand new uh, kind of inner working for us. And so we're excited to be able to uh, partner with Salem Media as well. And so it'll be everywhere. We'll put all that out tomorrow, and it's going to be glorious. If you think God's going to use it, shout amen. amen. Pray, pray, pray that the Lord will use it to change many, many lives. Well, let's pray, and then we're going to jump right into our series here in Ephesians, and we're going to pick up in just a moment in verse number 16 for our verse-by-verse -verse study of the Word of the Lord. Father, tonight, in the mighty name of Jesus, I want to say thank you for allowing your presence to be tangible in this house. Thank you that we can come to church and, Lord, it not just be some boring, long, drawn-out, mundane religious nonsense, but we can come here and we can sense the anointing of God, and we thank you for that. We can walk in here with a heavy burden, and we can feel it lifted at the altar. We can feel it lifted during worship and during preaching. So, Lord, tonight, may I use the gift you've instilled in me to encourage the body of Christ, both in this room and at large around the world. And we're excited, Lord, that the movie you allowed to produced through us is going to be streaming around the world. That's exciting. That's wonderful. But Lord, right now, we're not going to lose sight of the fact that we get to open the Bible together and grow as a local church family. So Lord, both in this room and all of our hub gatherings and networks and people around the world tonight that are watching and will watch later, we pray that the Word of God would just manifest great power and authority in our midst. Use this verse or however many verses we get to in our systematic study tonight to speak to us, to deepen us, 
to mature us in our walk with Christ. And we'll thank you for it in the name of Jesus and all of God's people said. Ephesians chapter number three. I want you to back up just a little bit because I want to give you the immediate context of where we ended last week because he really ended on a high note. It was almost like, wow, same bat time, same bat channel to be continued. And I wanted to dig in a little bit deeper, but it sets the platform for the message tonight in a beautiful way. So look at verse 14. Paul says, for this cause, referring to the fact that he was called to go through tribulations, trials, and problems for the furtherance of other people being reached. And let me just say this. I didn't necessarily dial into this a lot last week, but sometimes your trials are not just for you. Sometimes your trials are for the people that are around you. Does that make sense? Because how you handle your trial is really the trial. Your problem is not your problem. It's how you handle the problem that becomes the problem. Because I remind you, whenever Paul and Silas in Acts 16 began to sing at midnight, you know what? The Philippian jailer, when he decided he needed what they had, he knew exactly which cell to go to. And they weren't fussing and cussing and threatening to call their lawyer like everybody else. They were singing. They were praying. They were rejoicing. And when the Spirit of God hit this man, he said, I want to be able to handle problems like that and their problem wasn't just for their release their problem was for somebody else's release can I get a witness and so he said look for this cause I bow I submit my knees unto the father of our Lord Jesus Christ he said look there's not an area of my life that is unsurrendered to the lordship of Jesus Christ verse 15 of whom the whole family in heaven, I love that, and in earth is named. So that's what we dialed into last week. We talked about the overarching church, the body of Christ. Do you realize that we have family in heaven and on earth right now because of the blood of Jesus Christ? I don't care what your background is. I don't care if you're red, yellow, black, and white, tall, short, fat, skinny, hairy, head, or bald. You hear me? If you are saved by the grace of God, we are brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. And every saint that has gone on before us into the heavenly realm, they are our family. And we got a big family. And since the body is a family, we ought to start acting like family. We got too many squabbles and squeamishes in the body of Christ. The family ought to act like a family. Amen. And look, you may have grown up in a sorry earthly family, but the family of God is thicker than your own blood relatives. And he said the whole family in heaven and earth is named because of Jesus. Now, all of that exciting introduction gets us to verse 16. That, shout the word that. Because this transpires... Because we are children of the living God, because we've been baptized into God's family through Jesus, that he would grant you, the word grant literally means that God will gift you this. Aren't you glad for the gifts of God? Aren't you glad for the manifested gifts of the Holy Spirit? I'm not just talking about the talents that you were born with. I know people that hate God, spit on the Bible, and smoke crack, and they've got talent. I'm not just talking about somebody that can sing or communicate or dance or pick up a rubber basketball and slam it, wham it, cram it and jam it or play an instrument. I'm talking about somebody that has been granted a unique supernatural gift from the Holy Spirit. Anybody can have talent, but it takes the touch of God to allow that talent to be a gift that is useful for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And so he says that he would grant you. He's going to give you something. Watch this. According to the riches of his glory. Holy smokes, we can stay there a while. That phrase is actually used a number of times in the Bible. Philippians 4.19 says, My God shall supply all your needs, comma, according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. You know what that means? That means when your resources have run out, his has just begun. There are no limitations to the riches of his glory. The depths of the Word of God. I mean, the absolute depths of the gold mine of God's Word. And sometimes we walk around with a curse of poverty over our life. And we're like, well, you know, I'm always going to be sick. I'm always going to be non-delivered. My marriage is always going to be a problem. I'm always going to be broke as a joke. I'm always going to cry. I'm always going to have these nightmares. I'm always going to have insomnia. Nobody likes me. Yada, 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 shmada. Do you realize that if you are saved by the grace of God, you are a multiplied quadrillionaire? You are rich beyond your wildest imagination. Quit walking around like, well, you know, it's just life. It's my lot in life. It's not a lot, but it's my life. 
You're a child of God. You're a son of God. You're a daughter of God. Throw your shoulders back, lift your head up high and say, I am a born again, blood bought, Bible believing child of the living God. I am free in Christ. I am saved. I am the riches of Christ Jesus. Man, we got to change our perspective. We have poor mouthed the gospel in American Christianity. We've poor mouthed ourselves into a corner. Well, you know, God just wants us miserable. I don't know what you've been reading. But Jesus came to give us life and life more abundantly, not life more redundantly. If serving Jesus is boring, you are doing it entirely wrong, neighbor. Now, look, it's not always going to be healthy, wealthy, and wise. But I'm telling you, you can wake up with the joy of the Holy Ghost, the Bible says. You can have a peace that passes all understanding. You you don't have to walk around coming to church, look like you've been baptized in pickle juice, sucking on a PVC pipe full of lemonade. Oh, my goodness. Life is just so horrible. Life is just so horrible. Aren't you glad you're saved and not going to hell? That's what horrible is. I'm glad I'm born again. I'm glad I'm saved. I'm glad I got a Bible that leads me and guides me and a Holy Spirit that speaks to me every single day and a Jesus that exampled how I'm supposed to live my life. We've got a church that's the pillar and ground of the truth and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And we're walking around like everything's bad, everything's horrible. Oh, no, as the song says, everything's all right in my Father's house. It's a good thing to be alive today. I don't care who's in the White House. I'm talking about God's house. I like it when the kids say, ooh, that's lit, Dad. (laughs) Woo, we better get lit up in this house. I'm tired of boring church services. Not around here, I'm preaching to the choir. Man, I preach some places, I got to walk out, look at the sign, make sure I didn't walk into the funeral home. I'm like, my goodness, is this a mortuary or a church? He's got riches. I'm not talking about just earthly cabbage in your pocket riches the riches of his glory and he said the gifts he gives us or grants us are according to those riches you think they're ever gonna run out god will never bankrupt himself you see it doesn't matter what happens in the american economy god's not going to look at gabriel and say ah man i missed it miscalculation here how much we got in the teal my goodness this month we're going to have to pave the streets of gold with asphalt we're in a mess I'm going to have to sell the Smoky Mountains and maybe even the Rockies just so I can pay the mortgage around here. Has it ever occurred to you that nothing has ever occurred to God? God has never sat around his throne and said, oh, wow, I never thought of that. Yes, he has. Because he can do exceeding abundantly above all we could ever ask or think. And his gifts that he grants us are according to his riches. And if that cannot give us some spiritual spizzerinkum, then I don't know what will. We are granted grace Mercy, forgiveness, and giftedness by God. Did you know, let me say this. I don't minimize salvation. But if you are saved, know this. You are just as called as you are saved. Because the same grace and the same gospel that saved you is the same grace and the same gospel that called you according to the hope of his calling. If you aren't born again, you've got a job to do. you got a job to do. I've got a job to do. And, and it's not just talking to a microphone on Sundays and Wednesdays. we got a job to do. we got to reach people with the gospel. And so he said, I'm going to grant you according to the riches of his glory. We could talk about that for a long time, but he'll circle the wagons in the next chapter and talk about gifts, and so we'll wait till we get there. Now watch this. This is... This is beautiful. This word I've been using lately, fantabulous. Okay, here it is right here. Fantabulous. To be strengthened. Let me tell you, some of you in this room. You know why it's important you come to church? To be strengthened. Some of you just need encouragement. Some of you just need to be built up. Now look, there's time. We've got to shear the sheep. I get it. But we're here to be strengthened. Why why do we read the Word of God every day? Not just at church. To be strengthened. What's prayer about? Intimacy. To be strengthened. What's fasting about? To be strengthened. Why do we learn to give? Why are we generous? Why do we operate in the gifts? To be strengthened. To be strengthened. To be strengthened. Now, knowledge, wisdom, life experience, and logic would tell me 
that if I need to be strengthened, it's because things are weakening me. The American church is weak, weak sauce. It's weak and it's woke, right? We need to be strengthened by the word of God. You know what strengthens us? Some of the stuff we talked about this past weekend, humility, fervency, generosity, expectancy. You know, when I come to church, I expect the Lord to show up and do something. I actually say, well, I'm just going to go to church if God decides to do something. No, no, I just expect him to now. No, Lord, I'm showing up tonight and I know you're about to change somebody's life forever. I just expect it. You see, if you don't expect it, you don't get it. We, we have this idea, and I'm going to divert just for a second. We have this idea that God doesn't have anything better to do at the judgment seat of Christ than just throw out crowns for people that don't deserve them. Let me tell you what you're getting back then, what you invest right now. If you think God is just going to throw out crowns because he's got an overloaded wheelbarrow. Oh, no, no. When the Bible says, and they cast their crowns at the feet of the Lamb, they earned those crowns because they were serving God and the people that were around them. They weren't just sit soaking and souring on their hands, walking around in a spirit of offense, mad about everything in all the world, upside down about this, ticked off about that. No, no, no. These people served God with their life and even were willing to die for him. And Jesus gave them crowns, not so they could keep them. We got this fictitious, nonsensical, baptistic idea. We're going to get crowns so we can fill up a wheelbarrow and walk around heaven and tell everybody how wonderful we were. You get crowned so you can cast them back at the feet of the Lamb and say, Thou art worthy. He that redeemed us back to God again out of every nation, out of every tongue, out of every kindred, out of every tribe, out of every people. Hallelujah. Crowns aren't for us to keep. They're for us to throw at the feet of Jesus because anything good in me, God did all of it. Anything rotten in me, Greg did every bit of it. And don't put your lip out because the same is true about you. We need to be strengthened in church. Our marriages need to be strengthened. Our children need to be strengthened. Our churches need to be strengthened. Now, let me say this. A church is only as strong as the families that make up the church, and a nation is only as strong as the church's strength. The devil knows that. Of course the devil knows that. He's not been after closing down Walmart, Waffle House, and strip clubs and weed dispensaries. He's not after closing down shopping malls, regal cinemas. He's after closing down churches. Why? Because the local church is the thing that is a burr in his saddle. And when you come to church, you ought to come to church to be strengthened. By the way, not just for me, you ought to strengthen each other. Just by seeing each other, being a family, you ought to strengthen each other, hug each other, love each other, shake hands, hug necks. I'm telling you, when you leave church, you ought to feel strengthened when you walk out. Your back ought to be a little straighter. Your smile ought to be a little bigger. Your heart ought to be just beating a little bit faster. You're like, whoa, man, I went to church and I got strengthened. Going to church like drinking milk. Mm, good for the bones. I don't know what milk really is, but you understand the analogy. <laughs> to be strengthened, watch this, with might by, watch please, his spirit. Did you notice what the common denominator is to the strength, which we're about to find out where that strength goes, where it's directed, because often our strength is misdirected. He said, we get that might from God by his spirit. That's capital S. That's the Holy Spirit. That's the Holy Ghost. The Bible says he strengthens me with his might by his spirit. I know not why that it is. That for so long, religious people, myself included, had such an aversion to the Spirit of God. We've preached entire topical, expository, systematic messages on the Holy Spirit, so I'm not going to preach it again. We'll do it another time. But it's amazing to me how the, and I'm just going to say American church, but the church as a whole, it's amazing to me how the body of Christ can operate successfully without the Holy Spirit. I mean, think about that. I mean, you, you get the right atmosphere, you can crank people up. What do we call it? Big screens, fog machines, and skinny jeans. You get things said just right, 
You'd like, okay, I got 45 minutes. Let's get them in. Let's get them out. We got to get to the next service and the next service. and the next. God forbid anybody gets saved or baptized or healing start happening. Oh, my goodness, what are we going to do then? No, we got one hour. We got to clock in. We got to clock out. And the American church, let's just be honest, has church whether God is there or not because it's just the thing to do. Church is just what we do. Listen, I like to feel like I've been at church when I go to church. And when you have to miss church, it should be so unbelievably wonderful that you miss church when you do miss church. And you're like, man, I want to get with my family. Man, I got to get with my brothers and sisters. Whoa, I got to hear some preaching. I got to hear what the singers got to sing. Man, you just want to be here. And I'm telling you, so often, let's just be honest, if we just allowed churches to continue the way that they are and never again mention the power of the Holy Spirit, nothing would change in the average church. Because we get our might and strength from everything else. But the Bible says that our might, we are strengthened by His Spirit. So let's just be honest. A church that is void of the Holy Spirit is, number one, a false advertiser. And number two, weak. There's no power in a church that does not promote and propagate the ministry of the Holy Spirit. I didn't say there wasn't success in it. You can be successful. I know successful people that don't give two flips of a wooden nickel about God or the Bible. I'm not talking about success as far as the world or as far as the ministry. I'm talking about consistent success in the eyes of the kingdom of God. We only get power one way, through the Holy Spirit. That's why we don't put on a Jimmy Carter smile and fake it till we make it. Look, I'm telling people all the time, don't force gifts. Don't force fruit. No, no, no. We operate under the power and the influence of the Holy Spirit. And guess what? When the Holy Spirit shows up, I don't have to scream in a microphone and let you know he's here. I don't have to tell you that. It's apparent. It's obvious. Because the atmosphere is shifted. The results speak for themselves, and when people walk out, they don't just feel entertained, they feel strengthened because the Holy Spirit gave them a holy word that they needed to make them a holy person. You see, look, I don't know the needs that are in the room. If I knew one of the needs, I could not meet them, but the Holy Spirit knows all of the needs. And can meet every one of them simultaneously. Emotional, physical, financial, mental, marital, spirit, you name it. He can meet all of them the exact same time. I don't have that ability. But if we will lean on the ability of the Holy Spirit, that's where words of wisdom, words of knowledge... The gift of prophesy. That's where those things come in handy because God will strengthen others through strengthening your gift. Am I making sense? Your gift is not for you. Your gift is for the body. And he strengthens us by his might through his spirit. Now notice where he deposits the work of God. Don't miss this. In the inner man. Say inner man. Inner man. One more time. In the inner man. He's not working on my flesh. My flesh is as unregenerate today as it's ever been. My flesh is wicked. My flesh is corrupt. That's why demons and curses can dwell in my flesh. And so he says that the inner man, the innermost being of who I am, my what we would call spirit man, is strengthened, encouraged, edified, built up, matured, whatever word you want to use to identify it. It happens when my spirit bears witness with the Holy Spirit. He ignites something in me that the world can't give me. He grows something in me that music of the world can't give me. That fragmented relationships can't give me. That Hollywood can't give me. That drugs can't give me. That the next fix or the next high or whatever can't give me. The Spirit of God works on the inner man to make me a holy individual. And I'm going to tell you why a lot of people are horrible in their outer man because they have nothing on their inner man. Now, I'm not talking about what they look like. I don't care. Listen, you, you can be born red ugly. But if you got a good spirit about you, 
You all right. People will overlook your imperfections. It's kind of like this. Let me put it in layman's terms. Is that all right? You know, I'm all into, you know, riding a bike and fitness and all that. It's cool. And I'm like, I'm approaching 50. It don't matter how many miles I ride. There's just a little bit I can't get off the belt. I told my wife, I said, baby, I said, I'm pedaling my feet off. Well, she said, well, you're just getting older. You know, your metabolism's slow. That ain't what I want to hear. But I'll tell you what I do know, and you ladies and you gentlemen know this. Even if you don't have a Charles Atlas chiseled Hollywood fake spray tan body, filtered Instagram 52 time body, right? If you don't have one of those, let me tell you what I know, husbands. If you'll serve that little woman socks off and love her every day of your life, she'll put up with your dad bod. She sure will. She'll put up with it. And if you have a good inner man, people will put up with your outer imperfections. No matter what you look like. No matter what you sound like. You ever talk to somebody that has a, uh, an obnoxious voice? I've had people say, your voice bothers me. I'm like, why are you here? <laughs> it's the only one you're going to hear on the microphone. <laughs> but you ever heard somebody just got an uh, uh, obnoxious voice? When you get to know that person, if they have a good inner man, you ever notice that that obnoxious pitch in their voice just goes away? Because there's something about the beauty of who they are spiritually that allows you to overlook them physically. They may not be the most knowledgeable person. They're not going to light up the whole room like a light bulb. They're not the, you know, what they say, sharpest pencil in the pack or the brightest crayon in the box. But they work hand in hand with the power of the Holy Spirit on their inner man. And the inner man has a connection with the Spirit. And because of that, this man, this woman, outwardly becomes obedient and in line with Romans 8 28 because the only way we can be like Jesus is when the spirit is speaking to our spirit man everybody's like well I'm supposed to be like Jesus yes but you can't be like Jesus outwardly unless inwardly you are filled by the power of the Holy Ghost you can't and I'm telling you there's a lot of disconnected people that are trying to work out legalistic things in their life because they think rules will make them righteous rules will make them rebellious Rules will make you frustrated. But when you get connected to John 15, 1, the vine of Jesus, and you allow the Holy Spirit to literally allow his fruits to be produced in your life. You ever notice it's not called the fruit of the Christian. It's called the fruit of the Spirit. Therefore, you can't live like a Christian unless you're connected to the Spirit because the Spirit feeds your inner man so you can bring forth the fruits to look like Jesus. Right? Am I making sense? Trying to make it as simple as I can. And so he says, the Holy Spirit gives me might in my inner man. But you know what the church has done? The church has made discipleship informational. We think if we give people information, it changes their life. We have more information ability in America right now and less real Christianity than at any other time in the history of the world. Discipleship was never meant to be informational. It is meant to be transformational. And that only happens when you have a valid relationship with the Holy Spirit. I used to preach all the time and hear preaching all the time. Like, well, you know, don't read them books about the Holy Spirit. Be careful in churches that say, welcome Holy Spirit. Be careful in people that get up there and say, come Holy Spirit or pray to the Holy Spirit. Now I look back and I'm like, man, I wasted a lot of time saying dumb stuff that was polar opposite from what the Bible actually teaches. Polar opposite. Can I remind you that when we preached our entire message, that revelatory message God gave us on the Holy Spirit, that you cannot get into the presence of the Father in prayer, but through that of the Holy Spirit. Don't discount the Holy Spirit. We talk about God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Yeah, but the first person of the Godhead that you meet in the whole Bible was the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. 
You meet the Holy Spirit before you meet Jesus or the Father right there in the Bible. I can't make that up. And I'm like, how did I miss that for so long? I wanted to miss it because I was taught work on the outward man. And as long as you have standards... Everything else will work out right. But the problem was, I was running with pastors that wore suits and ties, carried King James Bibles, and were sleeping with bus children. Addicted to pornography, 10,000, 12,000, 15,000 people in their church. Would look at a church like ours and say, those bunch of Pentecostal wannabes, those bunch of charismaniacs, those bunch of people that think they can cast out demons, yada, 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 yada. What they think is, if you have wire rim glasses, a King James Bible, you don't preach in blue jeans, and you shout a lot at people. You don't go to movies. For some reason, you can go to Redbox or have Amazon Prime, but you can't go to movies. I mean, I'm from, a, I'm from a whole generation of people that said women were going to hell if they wore pants. That's crazy to me. And I look back now and I'm thinking to myself, man, I'm surprised. Well, I guess they did think I was in a cult. I look back now and say, man, I was in a cult. Because you know what I was taught? It was about outward performance. Do outward things, outward things. It's how you dress. It's how you act. No, 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 no. If you're not working on your inner man, I do not care about your outer man. You can ride 15 bicycles a day. You can do 7,000 push-ups a month. I don't care. You can drink barley green. You, you can own Planet Fitness. If you don't work on your spirit man, nothing else is going to work. By the way, if you work on your spirit man, if you work on your inner man, you'll want to be a good temple of the Holy Spirit, right? But you'll be a decent person. You'll be a godly husband. You'll be a godly wife. You'll be a godly son or a daughter. Listen, the more I work on my inner man, the more I preach different. Were you here this past Sunday? I have to learn that it's not about the outward perception. It's about the inward reality. And the inward reality is, when I am in tune with the Holy Spirit, you benefit from it. Because he's strengthening me in order that I may strengthen you. He does it through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so I'm, I'm just saying, church, we have to work on the inner man. You know... This is a controversial subject, and so I, I, don't, I don't want to talk a lot about it because I want to preach a whole sermon on it very, very soon. But I never understood in Ephesians 6, right? We wrote a book about the armor of God. Never understood in Ephesians 6 what he actually meant until it happened to me when he said, praying always in the Spirit. In the Spirit. And I would just dismiss that. I'd be like, well, you know, I'll, I'll pray in the Spirit, whatever that means. No, 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 no. There's an actual praying in the spirit because first corinthians says he that prayeth in an unknown tongue speaketh to god and edifieth himself someone says well i don't know what you're saying i ain't talking to you so it don't matter i'm working on my inner man i'm working on who i am on the inside not on the outside and so if i work on who i am on the inside it's a game changer now, look, I, I know people get thrown off of that. They're like, oh, my goodness. Okay, look, I'll, I'll teach you a whole biblical mandated message on it. But I'm going to tell you something. I used to be the world's worst in getting distracted when I would pray. I'm talking about as a pastor. Whether I was on my knees, whether I was standing up, whether I was riding my bicycle, whether I was laying down, whether I was in the pulpit. I would get so distracted. And I know some of you that way. Man, you, you can just be praying, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus. Squirrel. Right? And there is a spirit of slumber and a spirit of distraction that will come upon you keep from reading the Bible. But I used to get so distracted when I would pray. And I would say things like, well, I don't even know what to pray. I've already been praying for 15 minutes and I'm, I'm out of people to pray for. What? And I would just get to a place where I felt like, well, if I don't have a list, you know, pray for Sally, pray for Susie, pray for Johnny, pray for Jimmy, pray for... If I didn't have a list, then I couldn't think. You know what happened after I went through deliverance? got baptized in the Holy Spirit, and began to pray in the Spirit, all of a sudden I found out the distractions were gone, and I could pray and pray and pray and pray and pray and pray because I'm not having to think of something to say to impress God because it's a perfectly crafted prayer through the utterances of the Holy Spirit. That's what it means to pray in the Spirit. And if you've never done it, you missing out, neighbor. you missing out. I'm telling you, you missing out. That's the facts. That's just the fact. It works on my inner man. Outwardly makes you look crazy. 
but inwardly it strengthens you and it builds you up. You know, the Word of God is not so you can have a facade on the outside and look spiritual. The Word of God is for the inside. It's a, it's a two-edged sword, right? It goes in. Cuts going in. Cuts going out. Hebrews 4.12, the Word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing, get this, to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner. Listen, the Bible is a discerner. You know why some of you don't read the Bible? Because when you do, the Bible reads you and it makes you nervous. A discerner of the thoughts and the intents of your heart. You notice everything about the Bible is inward it's for your thoughts it's for your heart it's for your joints it's for your marrow it's for what's inside you the word of God will build your inner man so if you do not feed your inner man with truth you will end up feeding your outward man with falsehood and debauchery of the world Because there's just two choices on the shelf, pleasing God or pleasing self. You are going to feed your spirit or feed your flesh. That is it. And I hate to be as down home, hillbilly and crude, but at the end of the day, here's how the old timers put it. All right? There is a, uh, there's a great big black dog inside you. A wolf, they call it, the old timers. There's a great big white wolf inside you on the other side. So you've got a dark wolf and a light wolf in constant combat. And the one that wins the battle is the one that you feed the most food to. People are like, well, I'm always miserable. You're feeding the wrong man, you're feeding the flesh. And then blaming God. Here's the interesting thing. If you feed the flesh, you ruin your flesh and you miss out on the spirit. If you feed your inner man, you fix your flesh and tap into the spirit. You get the best of both worlds. Hmm? You get the best of both worlds. And so he says, you need to be strengthened by the Spirit, capital S of God, in your inner man. So my question is, what are we working on in church? Got all these programs. Walk like this, dress like this, talk like this, hold the mic like this, hold your mouth just like this, do this, do this, go here, don't go here, like this person, don't like this person, watch this, don't watch this, listen to this, don't listen to this, drink this, don't drink this, eat this, don't eat this. And I'm like, my goodness, I'm exhausted by the rules. I thought Leviticus was fulfilled. And we walk around with all these burdens on top of us. You know why? Because the church has wrongly positioned us to work on what people see. Because man looks on the outward appearance, but it's God that looks on the what? Heart. God looks on your inner man. That's why he connects to the inner man. And so the Holy Spirit strengthens us on the inside. On the inside. So let's just be honest. I don't care how big we grow on the outside. If we don't deepen ourselves on the inside, we are infants in the kingdom. And there are churches that have tens of thousands of people in them. And they are big numerically. But as far as the inner man is concerned, it's just a bunch of nursery babies. Now, do we believe in leading people to Christ? Let's, let me say this. Of course we do. Loving people right where they're at, growing them, watching them get baptized, and, of course, deliverance as part of discipleship. Absolutely. But I'm, I'm going to tell you something. This is, this is just the truth, okay? Every church has a context. You know that? Every church has a context. So, yeah, of course we want to preach the gospel to lost people. We do it every week. But I'm going to tell you something. And, and you may get saved here and, and, and grow up with us here, but, but you need to understand this. 
Global Vision is not a church for baby Christians. Now you can grow here. Am I making sense? You can, of course we want you to grow. We want you to be disciple. But if you stay a baby, you will be miserable here. Because when we pull the bottle out of your mouth and we put a napkin around your neck and we drop a T-bone steak in your lap, you can be like, ah, my last church, let me have a bottle for 15 years. I know, that's why you're whining. Eat your meat and potato there, Junior, right? So this is, this is not a church for like, for people that, that got saved 10 years ago and they're like, still on John 3, 16. It's just not. Okay, th th this, this is not the church for somebody that never reads their Bible. And I've noticed that, especially a, a lot with the online community. And we've made some shifts with that, right? Because we get a lot of people that watch us and stuff. But sometimes I'm like, my goodness, did you not listen to the message? You just asked me 15 questions that I answered 42 times in the message. This is not a church for people that don't read their Bible. If you like being spoon-fed, I promise you, you are not going to enjoy our church. Because we believe in backhoe feeding. Whoa. Open up. You'll be all right. You'll be all right. You'll be all right. You throw it two or three times, you'll get through it. Right? That's because we want to work on the inner man around here. I want a church of spiritual people. Not mindless robots that just do everything right according to what the pastor says. No. We've turned that curve. I want to work on your inner man. I want to work on my inner man. I want to work on who God wants me to be, not who denomination wants me to be. Not, not who the political arena wants me to be, not who Hollywood wants me to be. No, I want to work on who God wants me to be. God wants you working on the inner you, connected to the Holy Spirit. Does that make sense? It's so simple. You'd think everybody would get it, but people hear this and they're like, well, I just don't, I don't like, oh, well, I'm sorry. Can't help you. Because we're just not one of those like buffet style churches. I mean, even in the transition, we're just a systematic verse by verse, line by line. Here's what the Bible says, and I can apologize for being stupid in the past, but I can't apologize for the truth of the Bible. Right? The Bible's the Bible. I don't get to say, well, you know, it really means this when I know good and well it doesn't. No, no, no. You see, the whole Bible is to work on what's on the inside. The Bible even says in the book of Proverbs chapter 3, verse 4, 5, and 6, and 7, and 8, which we all time skip, it says that the things of God will be health to your navel. <laughs> health to my navel? Yeah. <laughs> it's like a spiritual umbilical cord. It connects me to my parent. Help me, Holy Ghost. I'm feeling something right now. And I mean, we, we get the nutrients because we're connected. It's health to your navel. There's nothing that working on the inner man won't fix in your outer reality. Nothing. I mean, just think about that. I was just coming to me. There's nothing that the inner man won't fix in your outer problem. Nothing, nothing, nothing. You see, for example, you don't have a money problem. You have a faith problem. But when you feed your inner man faith, all of a sudden you find out you don't have a money problem because it wasn't money issues. It was a heart issue. It was a steward issue, stewardship issue. It was a faith issue. You just didn't believe God. You saw the numbers and the numbers didn't make sense, so you believed the bank. But when you feed your inner man, you start seeing things differently. Church is no longer a choy, chore. Music is no longer something that you just kind of sit through. Preaching is not something that you just endure. You enjoy it. Now, sometimes you have to endure it too. I get it. But I'm just saying, church, and we're not going to go any farther, but I, I, I'm just saying we have to work on the inner man, the spirit man. The church has far too much fleshly operations. Just too much. Across the board. Ours included. It's, it's not about show. It's about flow. Does that make sense? 
And there's times if we're not careful, we can be about show. No, no, no. It's about connection. It's about the flow of the Holy Spirit. He strengthens me. Some of you tonight, you just need a word of being strengthened. You just need to know you are highly favored of God. You just need to know He loves you deeply, desperately. You are the darling apple of the eye of God. Let me tell you something. Did you know that every single one of us in this room can live as if we're the only child? I'm so spoiled by God, it's like you don't even exist. And it should be that way for you. It's like I'm an only child. You see, outward man preaching has given you the idea that God's always mad at you because you didn't dress the part. Your hair color didn't match the denominational hierarchy. You slipped up and said a cuss word. You, you, missed, a, you missed a service in one month. God's going to kill you with a lightning bolt, right? Flip your car over and all that nonsense. Because we've been taught that as long as we outwardly conform and perform, that no matter how miserable we are, at least it'll get God off our back. That's not the God of the Bible. God wants to fill you with peace. You don't have to go to bed tonight with anxiety and basketball-sized ulcers and chewing your fingernails to the quick and sucking 10 bottles of NyQuil. You don't have to. There are some people, God bless you, I love you, but you come to me with the same exact problems you've had for a whole year, and I tell you the same exact thing. And if you didn't get it then, you're still not going to get it now until you start feeding your inner man and quit worrying about what you see around you. You see, you think God's always bummed out with you. God's always mad. God's always upset, right? He's making a list, checking it twice. No, stupid, that's Santa Claus, not Jesus. And that fool ain't even real, right? We, we've made our Heavenly Father some glorified Santa Claus. He's making a list, checking it twice. He's going to find out who's naughty and nice. We all been naughty this year. We all getting cold in our stocking. We all messed up. What a silly way to present God. I hear these preachers all the time. Well, I'm telling you one thing. God won't use a dirty vessel. I'm like, that's the only kind he's got, stupid. He ain't got another kind to use. I know we're supposed to live holy and live right in the fear of the Lord and we walk in that, but we got this idea. Oh, as long as I look good and look holy, I can live in ungodliness and God will overlook it. No, he won't. And we won't either because eventually you'll get found out. You're going to get caught. You're going to get your hand in a cookie jar and we're going to say, mm-hmm. How's that suit and tie in King James Bible working out for you, Skippy? Oh, you don't go to movies? Yeah, but you look at porn all night long while your wife's asleep. Right? Get up with a microphone, scream about the love of God, go to Waffle House and run your waitress through the meal. Treat her like a jerk, give her a $2 tip. That's what she deserves. You'd be in hell if you got what you deserve. You wouldn't even get a $2 tip. You wouldn't even get $100. You wouldn't even pass go. You'd go straight to hell without the grace of God. And we got this idea that as long as we look spiritual. No, no. I ain't trying to look nothing. I want to be spiritual. I want to be holy. I want to be righteous. I want to be godly. I want to be separate from the world. I want to be you therefore perfect even as my Father which is in heaven is perfect. Matthew 5, 22. I want to be that. I want to strive for it. I'm not saying that I'm going to be sinless, but I am saying I want to sin less. That's that baptism of humility that we need. Am I making sense tonight? I'm just helping. I'm, I'm, I'm helping myself more than helping anybody else. Praise God. So we, we, we can't be a, a normal religious organization that just focuses on the outward. I mean, you talk to people that travel in church ministry. <laughs> That's all we see. It's disgusting. Outward, outward, outward. And nobody's working on the inward man. And we wonder why everybody's life's falling apart. Because we have so focused on what everybody can see. When God ain't interested in what they can see, what they can see will change when what they can't see will start changing. Because who you become on the inside is who you really are. This thing right here, just a shell. 
This is just a shale right here. Just a shale. Everything about the kingdom is invisible. It's inward. It's the, as the Bible says, hidden man of the heart. And that's why the Bible says that to guard your heart for out of it, the innermost being of who you are, are the issues of life. Now, next week, he's going to tell us that once we work on the inner man, we can understand the inner workings that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. It doesn't mean the organ. It means in the inner man through the working of the Holy Spirit. These words connect. These phrases, these verses connect. Don't take the Bible out of context and make it say something silly. That's what cults do. Read it for what it actually says. Take it in the context and say, okay, Christ dwells in my heart by faith. How does he do that? Through the working of the Holy Spirit in my inner man. He ain't sitting on my shoulder. He's in me. Through the person, and the work, and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. So my admonition tonight is that we stop bowing to the dictates of religious people and conforming. And we start filling ourselves with the power of the Word and the Spirit of God so we can start transforming. So I'm not interested in conformity. I'm interested in watching God change your life, change my life, change our lives, and that only happens when we, through the Spirit, work on the inner man. If that makes sense, would you say amen? <laughs> Father, tonight, thank you for the word of the Lord. Thank you for its clarity. Thank you for its, its call to action. <laughs> you never just... Tell us, okay, here's the deal, now forget it. No, no, you give us a call to action, and the call to action is work on the inner man tonight before you go to bed. Work on it tomorrow when you get up every day and all that we do. So, Father, tonight, just give us a, a fresh baptism of humility, a fresh baptism and inner working of authority. And, Lord, just help us to walk out tonight and, and re recognize you have... You have so given us everything that pertains to life and godliness. But you didn't give it to us so we could put on a show. You gave it to us so we could get in the flow of God's power and God's presence and God's spirit. So Lord, tonight, just use this simple teaching in-house and online to set people free with the reality that we are not under the tyranny of a God that's looking at every single mistake that we make for the purpose of just whipping us when we come home. No, we're looked at through the lens of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And although practically we may be a mess, positionally we are perfect in the eyes of God, accepted in the beloved, seated with Christ in heavenly places. We are sons and daughters of the Most High God. That is our identity. So may we take that identity and tonight go home and have a revival of the inner man. Strengthen us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Let's all stand, get around, hug each other, love each other. Don't forget, please, tomorrow, help us promote. Come out in Jesus' name, in-house and online, and let's get it around the world so many, many people in their house, in their homes, in their pajamas can be set free by the grace of the power of the name of Jesus. I love you guys. You are not dismissed. You can just leave, and we'll see you this weekend. Amen. God bless you.